Hey there, I'm Ken, this is Canadian Retro Things. Welcome. Today, I'm going to look at five different games on five different systems. Yes, you heard me correct. Five different games on five different systems. But here's the rub. They're all the same title released by the same company. I'm talking about The Eliminator by Adventure International. Yes, that Adventure International, the one started by Scott and Lexi Adams. Adventure International actually released a lot of really good video games other than those text adventures they were so well known for. Now these games are not completely different from each other. There are some common elements across the games. But I hear you asking, how different are they? I guess you're just going to have to watch the video to find out. Now why did they do this? That I don't have an answer for. Perhaps they did it to um, maybe kind of stop some of that schoolyard fighting over who's got the best copy of the game on their system. Or maybe they were just well ahead of their time with a gotta collect them all attitude towards this game. Before we get into the games themselves, I want to talk about another interesting thing about this game. As I said, it was released on five different systems. But if you look it up on the internet as a general search, of course, Wikipedia comes up. So we click on that. And it shows it as being released on three systems. The TRS-80 in 1981, and by TRS-80 they mean the Model 1 or 3, just like where the text adventures you know so well were originally developed. The Apple II version was also released in 1981, and the Atari 8-bit version was released in 1982. But where are the other two versions? Could it be that the internet is wrong or incomplete? I'm sure it's just Wikipedia. Let's look elsewhere. Now we're on the TRS80.org site. This site is more in-depth on the Model 1.3 version, but it also shows that it was only released on the Model 1.3, the Apple II, and the Atari 8-bit. That's very strange. The very foundation of my life is falling apart finding out that the internet can be wrong. Luckily, I know the other two systems it was released on and can search for them directly. Over on myabandonware.com, there's some information about the Commodore 64 version. Although, interesting that this site only has it as available for the Apple II and the Atari 8-bit and the C64. Again, this is only three systems, but we do know of a fourth already, so let's find out what the fifth is. And finally, we find the fifth and final version on a game site dedicated to the Tandy Color Computer. This site is by L. Curtis Boyle. So now we have all the pieces of the puzzle. Let's look at the games in approximate order of when they were released. The first one I'm looking at is the TRS-80 Model 1 and 3 version by Wayne Westmoreland and Terry Gilman. It was released in 1981. As you can see, it's very much like Defender. As a matter of fact, originally it was called Space Defender and even had a rolling landscape at the bottom. Fearing legal reprisal, it was changed. The title became The Eliminator and the rolling landscape was replaced with a series of towers for the humans to stand on. This did not stop Williams Electronics from threatening a lawsuit against the game. The settlement came down in the form of the game becoming the official Defender version for the Model 1 and 3. I would, in fact, say that this is one of the best games I've played on the Model 1 and 3. If you have the opportunity, I would highly recommend it. If you've ever played Defender, then this game will feel very familiar. The controls have excellent responsiveness, the sound is very good. However, I am playing this on an emulator. The control scheme is the arrows for movement, spacebar for fire, and enter for your smart bomb.
Here we find ourselves playing the Apple II version, also from 1981, written by John Anderson. This one has an excellent splash screen. Getting into the game, you can see that it varies greatly from the previous version. There's no bottom on the screen, as well as no humans. There is some sort of radar, but it doesn't show enemies. I'm not actually sure what it does. It has a blinking light flashing partway across it some of the time. Above that, there's a bar that I thought was a timer, but nothing happens when it fills up. The keyboard layout is something that takes a lot of getting used to. Right arrow is up, left arrow is down, A is thrust, S is change direction, D is fire, and to stop moving you hit thrust plus either the left or the right arrow depending on which direction you're facing and moving. I realize the original Apple II keyboard only had the left and right arrows, but I think they could have chosen different, less confusing keys for up and down, and maybe just one key for slow down? The control key or the left shift key were right there under my pinky. I played a bunch of times, but never figured out what I was doing other than trying very unsuccessfully not to die. I could not find instructions on the internet, and yes, I actually did end up looking for instructions for this version of the game. Now it's time to look at the Atari 8-bit version. This one was written by Steve Coleman and released in 1982. This version is the first time in these games we see the mechanic of the ship tilting up and down so that you can destroy things above and below you, especially the buildings on the ground, much like Scramble. Once in a while, when you destroy a ship, a human captive falls out and you try to catch them before they hit the ground. This version also includes the top of the screen, which does remind me of Yar's Revenge, that continually grows giving you a smaller playing field. It's a fast-paced game. Destroying buildings does nothing but give you points, unlike in Scramble where that's how you refill your fuel. You have a timer that once it reaches the end, the top of the play area resets to the top of the screen. All in all, a good pick up and play for a little bit type of game. The sound is good, good explosions. My one complaint is that the ships are a little small and hard to shoot. The next two versions I'm looking at are the Commodore 64 and the Tandy Color Computer, which is the perfect segue to talk about Retro Rewind. If you're playing games on your C64 or Coco, I cannot stress enough how much easier it is to use modern cartridges for loading those games. Retro Rewind carries both the Kung Fu Flash cartridge for the C64 and the Coco SDC for the Coco. If you have original hardware, but not one of these cartridges, I think you should order one now. With these systems, both of these are my most used modern accessory, and if you use my discount code of CRT10, you will get 10% off your order. So visit www.retrorewind.ca 
for your Commodore and Coco needs. And don't forget to use CRT10 at checkout. And here is the Commodore 64 version, released in 1982, written by Daniel Lindsay and Constantine Othmer. Here we return to more of a Defender style setup with the radar at the top of the screen. With a long press of the fire button, you drop a bomb. Your goal in this game seems to be to destroy the buildings along the ground where the bad guys spawn from. This version lacks any people to save. This version has good sound as well. I would say on par with the Atari version. It's a decent Defender clone that differs itself with the bomb dropping on the buildings. It's not one of the top games like this for the C64 that I've seen, but I would put it somewhere in the middle of the pack. And the final version is the first version that I played, and that is the version released in 1983 for the Tandy Color Computer. It was written by Britt Monk. This version definitely has a few problems. As you may notice, the sound is not great. I know the Color Computer is lacking a dedicated sound chip, but it is capable of much better than this. And you probably noticed it doesn't run as smooth as the other versions. This does, however, have some similarities with the Atari version in that your ship tilts, a mechanic that I quite like and that was not used in a whole lot of games. You also have human hostages that will fall out of some of the ships when you destroy them. Unlike the Atari version, you can see which ships may potentially drop a person, as they are large enough to have a window on the side with the person in it. Blowing up buildings does replenish your status bar on the top of the screen. However, I never lived long enough for one of the bars to hit empty to see what happens. As it looks like more than one, I would guess that maybe they're fuel and ammo? Just like the C64, this is not the best version of a game like this I've seen on the Coco, but it is definitely far from the worst version that I've seen. There we have it, five different games on five different systems that are actually the same game by the same company. So which one would I say is the best? They're just a little bit too different to really compare them, but I can tell you which version of the game I enjoyed the least, and that was the Apple II version, mainly because I think they could have done something so much better with the key layout on that game. Now, which game impressed me the most? I would have to say that that would be the TRS-80 Model 1 and 3 version. It's just a really solid, good version of Defender. The games that were the most similar were the Coco version and the Atari version. Although they both had negatives and positives that pretty much balanced each other out, so if I had to choose between those two, I would probably say the Coco version, simply because it's the one that I have nostalgia for. As for comparing all five of them, yeah, the games are just too different to be a fair comparison. So five different games on five different systems that are the same game by the same company. A very strange thing to do. But 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget that a like, a subscribe, and a comment below are all things that help the channel out a lot and are greatly appreciated. But until next time, see you later.